Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is all about IPOs, exits, Series F, and, and what the, what's next for the billion dollar company. So I want to kick off. We've got Jacob Deguer here from iZettle. This is a, this is a later stage company. Uh, they're valued uh, quite highly, definitely a unicorn. And we've got uh, a venture capitalist and, and Adina Friedman of the NASDAQ here. So guys, what kind of, kind of advice would you give to a company like iZettle if they were looking to go public right now? <laughs> well, Thanks. I would say I think that your company has done a spectacular job of building a base, having a great business plan, and you're, you're, you're at the stage where you have a lot, a lot more predictability into the, way, the future of your business. And at that point, it's time to start to look at how can you get access to permanent capital to continue to allow yourself to grow over the many, many years that you're going to be in existence as a great innovator in a fintech company. So we would be welcome, we welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with you about how best to get access to that permanent capital, but also to make it so that your, your early stage and mid stage investors have a chance to have a great liquidity event as well. So we look forward to having that conversation when the time That's is right. That's a great pitch. <laughs> That's a great pitch. Thank you. You're welcome. I would say uh, in addition to choosing NASDAQ uh, <laughs> as probably the primary consideration, um, I would say the, the advice, I, I, I ran Goldman's internet business for 10 years before becoming a venture capitalist, and the advice we would always give great companies like iZettle is you don't go public when you can go public, you go public when you want to or when you're ready to go public. And a lot of people can make that mistake to say, oh boy, I can go public. It used to be a mistake more in the past. You wanna basically wait as long as you feel necessary to wait. And the good news is there's a tremendous amount of capital available in the private markets that wasn't previously there, but being public is not such a bad thing so long as your company is ready for it. So Jacob, are you thinking about going public at all anytime soon? Well, a lot of people are thinking about it, uh, so I, <laughs> I, I need to think about it as well. But uh, what we have said so far is really that, that we're preparing the company, um, and obviously subject to all market condi conditions, but it's a lengthy process, so we have started that process. Interesting. And what, what does that mean, getting the company ready? Because there's a lot of entrepreneurs sitting here who might say, well, you know, in a few years, if I have a company big enough and I want to take it public, what does that mean? It, it means a lot of administration <laughs> and a lot of prepar preparations. But it also means actually that you get a good sort of second opinion of the state of your, your business, I would say. I mean, we, we need to run through all the different processes that we have, all our different uh, sort of committees, but also looking at the, the fundamental core. Are, 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 we, are we in a good place or not? Yeah. So it um, takes, takes a lot of sort of management time and, and the involvement from all employees. So. Scott, you, you wrote a piece recently, or you're working on a piece around companies staying private for longer, and actually some of the issues that arise from that as well. Can you just lay out your thinking around what we've seen, the trends in that space, uh, and what are some of the potential pitfalls? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say to the point about uh, a company being ready, the most important thing is predictable growth. Right. Know your business well, know that you can predict ideally quarter to quarter because public investors, especially hedge funds, um, the institutional investors are ruthless when it comes to surprises. Your private investors are much more forgiving when it comes to surprises. So know, know your growth well, and most companies don't. And that's a, that's a hard kind of hurdle to get over. But what's fascinating, what's happening, as these companies are waiting much longer to go public, the lion's share of the kind of fundamental growth, let's call it alpha, is being captured by private investors. When you, when you look at IPOs like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon. Um, Amazon, Amazon. If you bought, if you looked at Amazon value creation before and after the IPO, 1,000 times the value. So right. if, if there's a dollar value before the IPO, a thousand dollars were created for the public investors. Facebook, that number's 2.8. Right. Or three. That's right. Google, right. Google, I think is 30. At least, yeah. Stark difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's a real challenge if you're a retail investor that doesn't have access to private investing to then be coming into the public markets and not see that alpha that's historically been available. Right. I mean, and that's, I think, the biggest issue when we talk about how do we make the public markets more attractive to companies earlier in their life cycle, but still at a point where they do feel like they're ready. And I agree with you. You should go public when you want to go public, not just because you can. Right. But at the same time, um, we talk a lot about the wealth disparity issues that are starting to be created, particularly in the United States. I would say it's more of an issue in the US than it is in the Nordics. 
Just want to do a quick plug for the Nordics. We've had 100 new listings in the Nordics this year. It's been a record year, raising 4 billion euros this year. Wow. And so the public markets in the, in, the, in the Nordic region are actually quite vibrant for small to medium companies as well as more established companies. But in the US, what we're finding is that it is a big step to go into the public markets. And yet, that means that retail investors are not getting access to great growth companies at that growth phase which is going to increase the wealth disparity in the country. And also you find that that value creation is also coupled with job creation. So a lot of companies after they go public, about 76% of all job creation since 2000 has come after the companies have gone public because they do have access to permanent capital. So we do want to make it so that the public markets are more attractive to companies like yourself. So you shouldn't feel like it's this massive burden and this huge obligation to be a public company. So what can we do about that? Should we make it so we have semi-annual disclosure obligations instead of quarterly disclosure obligations so that you can have more of, you can have be more growthy and a little less predictable quarter to quarter, but still show that you're, you're meeting your business plan? Should we make it so that the proxy access is uh, raising the skin in the game for someone to have access to your proxy. There are a lot of things we can do, I think, to make the public markets more attractive, and Nasdaq's very focused on that. Jacob, is that something that you're thinking about, about what could, need, what could be done, what could be changed, what could be reform in the public markets that would make it more attractive for a company like yours, not necessarily Izettle, but for, for these larger European startups that, that we have now? Uh, you, your question to me was what kind of preparations were, were needed to, to potentially go public and I was just describing some of the processes. Then obviously there are some, some very clear benefits. I mean, uh, if a, a company like Icell who wants to continue on a growth path, going public would mean that we could access capital to pursue that, that, uh, that option. And I mean, it comes with the visibility and, uh, and right. the possibility of, of attracting new people to the company and so on and That's so right. forth, new currency to acquire other companies. So there are lots of benef benefits, but not really sure if, if the process could be that different. Yeah. I mean, still, you, you need this sort of transparency, you need your, your, uh, to have your ducks in a row to, to be a listed company. So probably a question for you, how you could potentially sort of simplify the process, whether it could be simplified or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question because um, on the one hand, when you're going public, you're accessing that average retail investor. So you're averaging the mom and pop. And they have, they have a right to know information, you know, have information and disclosures. But in some areas of the world, particularly the United States, and I would say even here too, there are a lot of politically motivation, motivated disclosure obligations put on public companies as well that frankly aren't really relevant to making a proper investment decision. So one of the things we're trying to do is get rid of some of those. But the other thing is, can you know, the financial advisors in the Nordics are actually particularly helpful in, a, in, a, in giving you the ability to kind of navigate you through the go public process. We do a lot of education around that. But it is still a big undertaking, it's mm. a, it, and it is a distraction to the management team. So it's a matter of making sure you feel like the business is in solid shape, it's going to continue to grow and do well while you're in that process. Yeah. And then it's just, um, it's, it's really a matter of making sure you have the right advisors to lead you through it. Um, Jacob, from your perspective uh, as a European entrepreneur, is there still a sense from European entrepreneurs that the US still looks like a more attractive place to list than the European markets? Wow, that's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, from my perspective, we're, we're in, in heart and soul, we're a Swedish company. We don't have any sort of US presence or revenues coming from the US. So for us, if we were to, to, uh, to go public eventually, I'm not really sure the US would be our sort of uh, natural go-to market. It would be, make much more sense to, yeah. to go to some European market where we actually have presence and uh, sort of the market actually knows about the company. So yeah, that would I mean, be I my think answer. They're, they're vibrant markets oh. in a lot of different countries, but obviously the Swedish market is a fantastic market, and we have had a lot of great successful companies come into the Swedish market. But you're right, if you are a global company with a global presence and you have global clients and you want to really promote a global brand, that's when you start looking at the U.S. and saying, well, perhaps I could get yeah. a different valuation. But I'd like to hear from you, Scott, because you, having been a banker and now a venture investor and guiding these companies as they grow, how do you look at, um, you've talked about the timing, but also how do you look at the different capital markets and what's available to them? Well, I, I actually, in addition to those, I was a Section 16 officer at a public company. Oh, there we go. So back in the bubble, uh, <laughs> so a NASDAQ company. Uh, yes, exactly. So I got yeah. to live as an uh, officer of a public company. Um, 
I, I think you're dead on. You go to the markets that know you best, and as long as there's depth of liquidity, and as you point out, there's lots of alternative markets, that's fine. And you can always do an ADR in, in US mm -hmm. if you find there's demand. I, you would know better than any of us in terms of the depth, but the depth of the US market is still by far unique yeah. in, in the global landscape. And so I, if you yeah. need to tap that, you, you got to have a listing in the US, but it's really a function of what you're looking for and how much you need to place. The, the, the thing that you mentioned that I thought was interesting about helping make IPOs easier, you're an exchange. You're not the SEC. You're not FINRA. You're not the, you're not the largest hedge funds or mutual funds. So, I mean, your, your hands are tied just like our hands are tied to some degree. Well, we're just players in this bigger game. And, and it's hard for me to see the public markets changing that much. It's hard to see, maybe over time, but it's hard to see the hedge funds, the mutual funds, the SEC changing overnight. And yet, I think you guys are in a really interesting position to help private companies perhaps have a gradual IPO. Think of mm -hmm. it as like a, a gradual public offering as mm -hmm. opposed to initial public offering and easing them into it, secondary yeah. trading in a way where you don't get secondary prices in front of public prices like what happened in Facebook. Right. So I think there's a lot of room for innovation, how we can just evolve this as opposed to being this stark binary like, I'm public now. So, a, so I, sh I should just be handing you a little bit you know, under the table here. So the, uh, we have something called the NASDAQ private market that does allow private companies to have access to episodic liquidity. And we basically facilitate tender offers. And that's generally been very successful for early stage investors and, um, and longer standing employees. So as a private company, if you do stay private longer, you do want to offer the ability for an employee to have some liquidity, to buy that house, to make sure that they can educate their kids as sexually as they want. And so we do have something called the NASDAQ private market. And it is kind of in a way, I wouldn't say it's an on-ramp, mm -hmm. but it does allow you to have access to uh, periodic liquidity um, and handing the liquidity to other private hands. Well, and, and the sovereigns have, what, That's $6 right. trillion? Dollars. Right, they've, exactly. They've 60x, if you look at sovereign investments, it's a 60x increase. Sovereign investments in tech companies in like the last 10 years, eight years, right. it's incredible. So, so you map that $6 trillion to your private placement business, right. and that gets very interesting. Yeah, so we, are, we definitely are growing very fast, and it's becoming a big part of that private journey is to basically use the tender offer process to allow for early liquidity and then move them over time into the public market. Guys, I want to I change tack as well into a different part of the fundraising <laughs> spectrum, something that's arisen really, really big in 2017, and that's the initial coin offering, and what with that, the rise of the cryptocurrencies this year as well into perhaps more mainstream acceptance. Jacob, I want to start with you. We've seen your US rival Square says it's experimenting with, with, with Bitcoin. Is that something you're looking at as well? Well, we, the, the thought has crossed our mind uh, a long time ago, but we realized that still very few people tend to buy sort of coffee and, and, uh, and things with, <laughs> with Bitcoin. There are other currencies uh, more frequently used, so we focused on that. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I mean, from, from the technology side of things, I mean, blockchain is something that we're yeah. sort of experimenting with uh, both for internal and sort of external processes. But no, we haven't, uh, we haven't launched sort of a Bitcoin offering to our merchants just yet. And Adina, just in the, in the last day or two, you guys announced that you're going to offer a, a Bitcoin futures product. Um, what's the thinking behind that? Why? So, so you convinced that Bitcoin is, is, is more than a fraud, as, as Jamie Dimon says, and actually something that's here to stay? So we actually haven't announced anything. And so really, we're, we're continuing to evaluate whether the Bitcoin can be an asset class that is subject to a more regulated market environment. Right. We do believe that were, were you to look at bringing the Bitcoin into a regulated market environment, that there are two ways to do that. There's the future. Um, and that allows for hedging and other, other kind of trading tr strategies. There's also the ETF, and the U.S. has not yet allowed for ETFs, Bitcoin ETFs, to be listed. But in the Nordics, we have actually two exchange-traded notes listed in the Nordic markets, um, a SEC-denominated Bitcoin ETN, as well as a Euro-denominated um, Bitcoin ETN, as well as an Ethereum ETN. So here in the Nordics, they've actually been more open to looking at this as an asset class and allowing for investors to have access to that asset class mm -hmm. through a regulated market. The U.S. is still, I would say, still evaluating it in general. Could you give us a few more details? Are, are you actually planning to launch this? Uh, we've cited in our story on CNBC.com, we've cited some officials saying that this, this is in the works. Can you give us something a bit more concrete? 
I would just say that we've been having active dialogue with a lot of clients and with partners about what, what might be possible over time. But you mentioned ICOs. Yeah. I, I want to shift, yeah. shift to ICOs. That's what I was going to jump on. Because, yeah. look, there, you know, there's a sucker born every minute, right? There's, there's <laughs> buyer beware. And, and when you look at some of these ICOs, not all of them, they are based on nothing other than an idea, a concept that's loosely mapped to some company name. And as we were talking about backstage, yeah. there's a very fundamental difference between these ICOs and, and equity that you would buy in the public stock, and that is equity. You're not actually buying an ownership. asset, an underlying right. ownership claim to that company. And that gets really, really sketchy and scary. It's not to say there isn't a place for them, though. If you think about the success of crowdfunding, you think about the success of getting people excited and interested in a company and access to a company before others might have access to it, it, there is a place for it, but I would be extremely thoughtful and careful if you're thinking about buying an ICO to say, what am I actually getting here? Right. So beyond the hype, beyond do, the do excitement. Think, do you think they're a fad, Scott? Do you think they're just kind of going to disappear? I, or, I don't or, know. Or are they a genuine, perhaps, rival to VC funding, even an IPO? Well, let me put it this way. If, if a founder is able to do an ICO and not end up in jail, <laughs> yes, they should do that versus taking any other capital because it's free money. Yeah. There's no, they're not giving up equity. It's literally free money. Do I think it'll come crashing down? Probably not. Will there be a significant reset? Will the regulators get involved? Will there be a, a complete blow up? I think you were commenting on one just recently or somebody was saying they read about something recently where... Yeah where the company didn't even exist and they can't find the people anymore, yeah. they, they skip town. I've I couldn't find the CEO, he doesn't exist. <laughs> so, you know, there, there, there's gonna be scams for sure, and, yeah. and so the retail investor has to be protected. So yes, I think there will be a reset, a significant reset, probably not unlike what we saw in the bubble, yeah. where you had a lot of companies that were being marketed off of ideas and hand-waving, and there was a significant reset among investors and regulators. Yeah, J Jacob, just want to jump back to your point as well very quickly on blockchain. You said this is a promising technology. It's something, of course, you guys are looking into as well. What, what's the promise of this technology for a company like iZetto? Well, actually, right now, what we're evaluating is whether we can use it for, for our, actually for internal systems rather than anything that we're displaying to, to, to our merchant base. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, sort of the, the way it's structured and the, the benefit it gives is also benefits to, to us internally. Yeah. Uh, guys, just want to wrap up. We're almost out of time. So just give us your outlook a little bit. Adina, we've, we've seen some stocks come to, new companies come yeah. to market. The likes of, uh, you know, loads of them have listed this year, but they've got off to a, a fairly sluggish start, a lot of those stocks. What, are you, what is your outlook for 2018 in terms of new entrants to the market? Well, I would actually say a couple of things. For, on the co companies that have come and listed on NASDAQ this year, and we have had about a, a little over 60% of the companies that have come to market in the U.S. have listed on NASDAQ, the average return across those companies is 20% so far this year. Yeah. So the companies that have chosen NASDAQ as their listing venue have actually had a, a really great experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are these B2B software companies, um, uh, cybersecurity companies, as well as some really great consumer companies. And I think that that have leveraged the technology to be basically to create almost like a subscription service. And I, so we've actually had a lot of success with the companies that have chosen the, um, the NASDAQ. We've had over 140 IPOs so far this year in the US. But the real success story has been the Nordics. And um, with 100 new listings this year in the Nordics, if you think about that in this, uh, relative to the size of the countries, they're really punching above their weight in terms of bringing, bringing, getting access to the public markets. In terms of 2018, I would say that we continue to see a really, really strong pipeline of companies looking to go public. And it's just a matter of them feeling like the environment is ready for them and that they're ready to, to um, enter into the public markets. Scott, super quickly, probably a question you can't answer, but Uber is, of course, a portfolio company. Uh, Dara Khosrow Shahi, the CEO, said 2019 is in, in the works for an IPO. Can they hit that timeline given everything that's happened? And do you think that's a realistic uh, time frame? Yeah, uh, my co-founder, Shervin Pishavar, and I were lucky enough to be in Uber from the very early days, the mm. Series B. And um, we've watched that company grow up like no other company we've ever seen. Yeah. And that's backing Facebook and LinkedIn and Palantir, a bunch of other companies in our careers. Um, uh, frankly, this company could go public whenever it wants to go public. Okay. There's no question in terms of the underlying metrics. It's just a function of when they decide and when they're ready. Great. Um, we're going to have to wrap this up, I'm afraid. Uh, the NASDAQ opening bell is next. So, guys, thank you for joining us, and thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks.